Rich Kids. I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yay, success. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah, you're not alone in hating Zoom. Uh, we had <laughs> we had to use this to teach um, lessons for English remotely, and it's just yeah. it's it's so bad sometimes. It takes take longer to connect than uh, bloody do what you want to do. <laughs> Ridiculous. Well, thank you again. Thank you for taking the time to join me today. That's brilliant. How are no you? Worries. How are I'm you? I'm good. Just just finished teaching three days there. And there are two more to go, and then we're done for the week. Okay, so what's it the five day crust course? I think is it or uh, it's a um, five day crumb. This one, so ah. it's uh, on, the, on, the, on the latest book, crumb. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, keep me busy. <laughs> uh, wearing yeah. a mask all day. Oh, so, God. yeah, yeah nice. so, not very good, but I got my glass of red now, so I'm ready for you. Yes, I've just we've just received some um, Italian gin to taste. As a oh, little. very nice. Yeah, sort of um, flavoured with licorice and bergamo and lots of other yeah, yeah. things. So give that a try. But no, brilliant. Well, thank you very much for agreeing to be the first guest on the um, on the blog post. Um, sorry, on the first guest on the on the podcast. Um, as I said, I've known, sort of, been a follower of you on Twitter for some time. I did yeah. a course with you. I think two day course. Long. Ten years ago. Yeah, 10, 10 years ago. So, you know, I'd, I'd need a refresh on my stuff. So, have you practiced since? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My wife, my wife is far, is the far better cook, but, you know, it's sort of, okay. but definitely sort of a bread's my domain. Sort of, it's, um, I've got book now, The Italian Baker. So I'm just plowing through that at the moment to try. Yeah. All recipes which is good but now still using your techniques which is good making my bread a lot better okay brilliant so i thought what we do is we just go through the questions that are put on because they said it's so much easier to do it this way okay By your way. brilliant thank you okay so first came across you in your first book and um, dough okay which yep. is completely revol revolutionized the way that i i make bread so it yeah. says that sort of you found your love for bread when you were a child. Okay, so well, it was it was, <laughs> it was that love. Uh, I was not very good at school, so I had to leave school early and I had to work with my hands. Yeah, and the only job I could do was baking. So when you're 16 or 14, 15, and you work in a bakery all the time, you don't love your job. It just becomes part of you. But all your mates are working in a garage, and they all got Friday and Saturday off, and you work your nuts off in the bakery. <laughs> Trust me, you don't like your job much, but you become part of you, and you can't, you can't deny it after that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so yeah, the the you know, if you want uh, a nine to five job, you definitely don't become a baker. That's for certain. No, for sure. Yeah, that's for sure. Cool. Okay. Um, you know, I, I I sort of started with my sort of love affair with bread after, you know, having to taste all the horrible sort of prepackaged sort of Chorleywood bread processed muck that we get in England. Um, do you think there's sort of a different attitude regarding bread um, between the UK and sort of other European countries like France and, and where I live in Italy at the moment, for example? Um, there's a different attitude to bread because the way we use bread is very different. It's uh, If you go to France or Italy or Spain or in this country, the first thing we serve you is bread on the table, and you you would never dream to sit for lunch or dinner in France, for example, without bread on the table. Bread is part of your daily life. It's like um, it's like asking you know, if you're in the morning before you leave home, who's going to buy the bread for lunch? Who's going to buy the bread for dinner? It's part of your daily life. Bread in in UK is getting better, but it's still something you treat yourself for the weekend. And so, you know, Friday, to Saturday and Sunday, you might get a nice loaf from the baker, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, still other people will buy the white sliced loaf, you know, full of chemical in there because it's convenience. Yeah. So we don't have the same culture on bread uh, as we do in France. And the British love good bread. You now they go to France and the first thing they do every morning for two weeks or a day is buy the bread in the morning. Yeah, is and maybe two or three times a day. So we want good bread, but we're not ready to change our lifestyle to go to the bakery every morning. Once because there's no bakery on your doorstep like there is in France, of course. It's a different way of buying bread. Um, so it's a, it's changed a lot, but still, 
and will never be the same because we the way we eat in in, in Britain is very different from the way we eat in uh, in France or, or or in Italy or anything like that. But you know, it's a myth also that all the bread are good in Italy or France or, or Spain. There's a lot of bad bread around there. You know, it's uh, it's um, it's um, I, I, as a British uh, people when they go on holiday, they got that holiday mentality. So everything is better. You know, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's uh, life is always better when you're on a day with a bottle of wine. You know, it's uh, um, uh, again, it's part of your pleasure. You get up in the morning, go to the bakery, you've done your work for the day. You know, uh, but you will never do that in this country. So it's a, uh, it's changing a lot. You know, and um, but to change that white slice bread mentality will take will take a long, 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 long time uh, in UK. And my dream when I first arrived in UK when I tried. My first white sliced loaf. I thought, "What the hell is that?" You know, well, I, mean, I don't want to eat that shit. It's like plastic bread, and the French love it. You know, a lot of French love that white sliced soft bread. You go to Italy, it's the same. Pan me, very cheaply made on big scale. They they love that. But my dream was always to relaunch sliced bread in UK and to relaunch uh, uh, to have a, uh, my, my my name on the shelf with a big loaf of bread, one kilo loaf with just three ingredients, like uh, water, flour, and salt, that's all. And yeah. we've done that with the, with the bakery. Uh, so it's, a, um, it's about choice also, you know. It's, um, um, some people can't afford good bread and they, they need to feed their family every day. So if you can buy your loaf of bread for 50p, of course you can do that to feed your family, you know. So it, we, we can't make buying bread being snob about it, you know. Yeah, it'd be great if you ever eat uh, good bread every day, but it would not happen. People buy cheap chicken, people buy cheap food because the way we live our life is very, very different, you know. So I always say, but if you can afford to buy good bread, buy good bread. But, you know, um, and knowledge also, you know, people go on to buy fine, uh, cheap sliced bread, but they don't know what's in there because it's convenience. It's about convenience all the time. It's like tea bag. You know, you could make your own tea and brew your own tea with herbs and everything, but why would you do that when you can get a tea bag in your cup and just and have it done? You know, so convenience is a big thing in UK. It's uh, the speed of life uh, is is crazy. Wow. And what we saw with with uh, uh, <coughs> the virus is people slowing down a bit more and a bit more of an interest on making all your own stuff at home and and stop eating crap fast and, and paying a lot of money for for junk food all the time. So I think. One of the silver lining of the virus is a lot of people uh, taking time to understand a bit more about what they're eating and fell in love again with uh, with baking and make their own bread and realize there's a um, there's a big difference to make your own bread and appreciate it and wasting it than to buy uh, white crap you know from uh, who, who make you bloated. So it will take a long time to change completely the mentality, but we're getting there. You know, you got um, when I think where UK was 35 years ago and where we are now. You eat so well in here, you know. I get frustrated when I go to France because yeah. the food is not. You got the best ingredient in France, but I don't know what's happened between the the market and then the restaurants. It disappears somewhere, you know. The restaurant <laughs> still needs shit tomato and stuff like that. It drives me bonkers, you know, uh, because they all try to cut um, cut cost everywhere. Uh, yeah. So they buy the cheap stuff, which is 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 sad, you know. But uh, if you go to the market, you get inspired by the food, the smell. You know, your instincts are okay enough. And if you're in Italy, you, you'll see it. Food is such, more in Italy than in France, I think, food is such a big part of life. Even if you're poor, you still eat well, you know. Mm. Uh, you, you will still take time to open a bottle of wine and receive people and make some simple pasta, but there will be bloody wonderful pasta, you know. Um, so it's a, it's a different way of, of looking at food and what food does to the soul, really. Uh, yeah, yeah I'd, I'd, I'd agree, definitely, you know, it, we've noticed sort of, you know, we've been lucky enough to travel throughout Europe and now sort of to to live in Italy. You know, you, you see there's just a, a, a sea change and then the different mentality sort of, you know, regarding food between the two countries. As I say, you see in England, you know, England English people perhaps maybe travel an hour or two to work in the morning, an hour yeah. or two when they get back. And the first thing they want to do is just basically to put some fuel in their body um, and then put, pop themselves down in front of the TV. But, you know, here in Italy, like you said, you know, they, like in France, they use food 
wine, you know, anything like that, to sort of use it as a as a method of sort of getting all together, getting the family together, sitting down to relax, to sort of chew the fat of the day. Um, yeah. You know, one of the things where you said that, you know, maybe one of the um, one of the good things about the virus is you said people slowing down, realizing, having the time to sort of reflect. Uh, one of my friends has has a bucket list they've got, which is sort of sixty things to do before they're sixty. And one sixty, of the, but yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that they wanted to do was to was to learn how to make their own bread. Um, yeah. And when they were visiting here in Italy before all COVID happened. You know, I was explaining to them, you know, how very few ingredients you need and how not easy, but, you know, not how it's not difficult to make your own bread if you've got the time to do it. So they were just completely amazed by the, by the sort of, you know, the lack of effort that you have to put into it. You know, sort of it's not something that takes up your whole day if you, no. if you shop or yeast. Obviously, sourdough is something completely different. Um, yeah. Um, and obviously, sort of, you know, on Twitter at the moment, you've got all the posts about sourdough month done by the Real Bread campaign as well, which is yeah. good. Um, yeah, sourdough is where I need to brush up my technique. Definitely haven't got that sort of. But, but my only problem with sourdough is everybody wants to make sourdough, and you probably because the way you just said, oh, sourdough, I need to brush my technique, is, is become fashionable. So everybody feel like I don't make sourdough, I'm missing out, or I need to make sourdough. And because I'm not worth it, you know, bread is bread. Make good bread. Don't worry about sourdough. You know, sourdough is easy in a way. It's, uh, it's become fashionable. That's the problem. I always say, if you want to make sourdough, you need to grow a beer. I'm working on it. You need to have <laughs> tattoos. You need to have tattoos everywhere. And look like a hipster. If, you, if you're a hipster, you make sourdough now, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's gone. You know, you know and... Uh, when... If you ask, if you say the word bread in any church, people do the ingredients. Everybody knows the ingredient to make bread with. And that's the only food in the world people know the ingredients. If I ask you tomorrow to make me a, a seafood risotto, you need a recipe. Yeah. If you need to make a burger, you, know, you need a recipe. Bread, flour, water, salt. That's it. You know? And it's all about skill. It's about uh, understanding what's going on with your ingredients. Uh, and that's, that's the beauty of it. But um, yeah. Stardo is a bit of a fashion, fashion curse at the moment. I think more, uh, more than ever. You know, make good, make good bread slowly, and you find. Yeah, like you said, sort of maybe you know, as with anything, start with the basics, get a good loaf of bread done, and then sort of you know, if you yeah. want to, sort of move it on from there. Because it, it was quite funny when COVID hit here in March. Obviously, I was looking at the news reports of everybody in England sort of panic buying toilet rolls. The things that that you couldn't get for love nor money over in in Italy was minestrone, and fresh yeast. Yeah. Nowhere, absolutely nowhere, completely yeah. sold out. So it's you know, so you say completely different attitude. But so, yeah. Um, yeah. Obviously, I've had the pleasure of doing one of your two day courses at your lovely bakery school in Bath. So what what eventually brought you to the UK? Why did you decide to come to the UK and? open up your cookery school and your bakery? Oh, bloody hell, that's a long time ago. I came in England <laughs> for two weeks earlier. I came in England for two weeks earlier because of a girl, you know? So uh, uh, I followed a girl around and uh, I came, then she left me, so I stayed in England. Um, and after three or four weeks, uh, I ran out of money. So I thought, shit, I need, I need to find a job. So that's how it started on those days it was easy to do that um, I spent a month two months three months six months and my life started there so um, it's funny I fell in love with it you know I, I loved that was back in 88 so I had nothing to do in France you know and, and I knew I needed something different I needed to 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 become a new person and the only way you can do that is move country because nobody as a French person, when you come to UK, you don't belong to any class. You're not a middle class, you're not upper class, you're not whatever class it is, you're a French man. So every I assume I could cook already. So yes, a little bit, but not much. And you know, is, um, it was funny. And when I, I remember I went to a party once and uh, of my, my girlfriend at the time, her father was a lawyer, so very posh. And um, I went to a dinner, um, a dinner party at uh, her house and everybody was on bloody black tie and all stuff. I was in my pair of jeans looking like a real <laughs> lemon. 
And um, one of the, all having cigars and cognac and everything, I felt, I felt really uh, in a bad thing. And so he came to me and said, so what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm a, I'm a baker with my French accent. He said, oh, really good. So which bank are you working with? I said, no, no, I make bread. I'm a baker. I'm not a banker, a baker. And he looked at me very blankly and walked out. Not a word, nothing, you know. Now, if you say you're, you're, a, ba you're a banker, nobody wants to talk, to talk to you. If you say you're a baker, everybody loves what you're doing. So it's changed a lot over the years, you know. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing how people see the, the world of bread now. Everybody's interested in it. Yeah, okay, brilliant. So w when you're doing your classes at um, the, the school, what do you think is the most important thing that you teach them? Um, to show the those bus. Yeah. To make them understand that if uh, you fear the dough, the dough will stick to you. So you must not fear the dough. It's take control of the dough. When I first started in the bakery, I learned to clean. I learned to to respect my environment. And then I was allowed to touch the dough. And when you, the dough, the first time I touched the dough, it stuck to me. And my boss used to say in French, il faut maîtriser la pâte, which mm. means in, in English, show the dough's boss, master the dough. Mm. If you're scared of it, then the dough will stick to you. So if you master the basic, then you can move on. It doesn't matter if it's sourdough, croissant, anything like that. Master the basic first. Yeah. And so I have to admit, so that's that, what I think that, that was one of my problems when I first started as well. You know, I was forever screaming from the kitchen for my wife's help. And she's just wandering with me covered in bread dough from sort of head to foot. But, you know, it's, it's, as you said, it sort of does, with, with practice, sort of come naturally eventually. Um, yeah. one, of the, one of the things that I'd never sort of seen live in action, obviously I'd seen it on the DVD that came with your first book, was the, the different technique that you have for working the dough when, after the ingredients are first mixed. So the best way I can describe it, sort of like a, a slap and fold rather than the English yeah. sort of knead with, with, the, with the heel of your hand. I mean, is this your, your particular technique or is it sort of used a lot by French bakers? If you look at my last book, uh, Crumb, there's, the story of this technique is in there. Mm. Back in France, in, uh, we stopped kneading and bashing the dough to death. We started to understand dough back in 1765. So we knew kneading and, and being harsh with the dough was bad for it. So from then on, we started to add different techniques where we started adding more air and more water into the dough. Because back on those days, in Italy, in France, Brittany, anywhere you wanted, the bread was very heavy and dense because the bread had to last for a very long time. But what the problem was with the bread on those days, the bread was so heavy that people couldn't digest it. It was too dense. So they had to change a way of making the dough. So this technique I use is based on those days mm. when we used to mix the dough in a, big, in a, in a massive big uh, trough and then the dough was... Um, mix together all the ingredients, then the dough was cut in big lump and thrown to the side of the trough and then stretch and then fold it by itself to get more air into it. The dough maker would take about two hours to mix the dough. It was such a hard job to do on those days. It was very, very hard. And until you had power to have a, um, electricity to, to make your mixer going, it, it was a very, very hard job. So. Um, my technique is what I've done when I wrote my first book was to readapt that technique into home baking. Because when I first read my first English baking book, I couldn't understand the way they were making bread. Like you said, the kneading stuff, whatever, that's not what a mixer does. A mixer doesn't do that. I never seen a mixer pushing the dough like that and adding more flour to it. So it never makes sense to me. Mm. So when I wrote my book, my idea was always to write a book, to go back to the basic, to explain to make the base the basic right so people get confidence of making the dough so it's um this technique is called the bertina technique now and people refer to it as a slap and fold and it's copied in different ways but that's the way that's where it started really uh it's ready to go back to the basic so when you start with a recipe you stick to that recipe you don't start adding more flour to it mm. because you're scared of the stress. so it's to understand that dough feel Really? Uh, I mean, now that sort of, you know, I've used it for a while, I, you know, I can't understand that you said people sort of adding more flour to it because it sticks and then, <laughs> and then not, and then the second time sort of knocking the air out of it that you've, you've you know, you developed yeah. in the first proof. But, 
Um, okay, just to, just to some other questions, but not sort of regarding bread. Obviously, you know, when I came down for, for the first course that I did with you, I, I realized obviously you're a big fan of rugby. And obviously see your tweets about Bath rugby sort of every time. But um, so how come, you know, how come a Frenchman's more of a fan of rugby than, than football? What is it about rugby that you love? Um. I used to throw football a little bit before, but um, I remember my, my primary school, when I was at school, uh, um, on the other side of the road, there was a, f a rugby pitch. I always remember seeing the, the rugby post for my home team in, uh, in Van from Brittany. And Brittany had never been a big rugby, the rugby thing. Um, so I don't know, rugby was always in my, in my blood. It's something I love about rugby. The, uh, and when I joined the army, when I was in the army, uh, we didn't play football, we just... Uh, we just play a kind of um, what we call Breton rugby. So <laughs> it was moving the ball from one side. It's a bit of the calcio in, uh, in Italy. You know that thing they do in Florence? Yes. You know, uh, Italy, yeah. Do, have you seen that? It's in crazy stuff. So in Brittany, there's called what we call La Sule, which is a very old rugby style where they used to play from village to village. So you had to move ahead of a ship or, or whatever it was. Mm. So very often we used to play that in the army where you had a big pitch and you move one ball, no rules except headbutting and, you know. So it was a kind of physical, physical way of doing things. Um, but you had, it was kind of very manly, which is the wrong thing to say, but it was a very kind of uh, blow your steam out and, and to, in a kind of, um, with a, a kind of rules, but very loose rule, if you know. There's, there's yeah. a bit of fighting or, or there were some rules you obey and, and whoever won at the end, you know, you, you shake hand and you move on. And rugby has, has got the ethos of, uh, of that. I love rugby for that because the battle is on the pitch. The battle is done um, very harsh and very hard. But after that, you shake hand and you, you, you forget everything. You have a beer together. Mm -hmm. And I've been coaching rugby now for, for many years in Bath as well. So rugby has been in my life since I'm in, um, uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm in Bath. And by coaching the kids from the age of five or six, you teach them the ethos of respect. And that's what I love about rugby. You know, it's a, if you, you know, Italy playing England or France or whatever, they play really hard. You know, and we know Italy has got a fine chance of winning sometime, but if they lose, they still have respect about it, which is great. You know, and it's, um, when, I, when I watch football now, I just feel so demoralized by, by the, the mentality of uh, overpaid and, you know, whinging and faking and everything else. It's everything I despise about, about the human race, really. You know, it's yeah. a, try to get advantage by cheating. And I really, really hate that, you know. And there's cheating going on rugby, but not the same at all when you see the wedge and everything else. And, and when you play for a team, the whole team, the whole team work together is, is magical. And Bath, I, I do a lot of coaching for the team in here, the first team. So I train them at the kitchen. We do stuff in Team Berlin. A lot of players are very good friends. Um, and a, a very good player who played for, for Bath who went to play for France now, playing for my home team in Brittany. <laughs> which I'm so, so shocked. So uh, it's, it's an amazing, an amazing, good ethos uh, sport, which I, I really, really enjoy. And when Bath play at home, I always got a flag outside the cooking school. And um, I love going to the wreck, you know. It's, uh, it's, um, it's uh, when you're part of a city, when the stadium is in a city, you know, the heart, the heartbeat of, uh, of the city is there. So I love that. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, the rugby is a good part. Yeah, I'd, I'd sort of agree with you. I mean, you know, football, you know, I, I, I just get cheesed off with it now. I was watching the England match last night and I just switched it off at half time because I was just... Did they win or did they lose? Um, no, nil-nil. Nil-nil yeah. nil against Denmark. But I was just spending so much time shouting at the TV. It was like, I'm clearly not enjoying this. But, um, yeah, but, it's frustrating. Yeah. Frustrating. But it's, it's, it's said sort of, you know, football's got the divisive sort of atmosphere where there's rugby sort of more inclusive. You know, where we used to live in, in Italy up in Piacenza, we were 20 minutes walk away from the local rugby ground where they were playing in the second division of the local of, of yeah. Italian rugby. You know, you wander along there, sort of um, crowds maybe about 100, 150. 
Um, and within two weeks, we changed from the strange English people that everybody ignored to having everybody buying sort of massive vats of wine for us every week. So you know, yeah. it's, it's great, but um, I'm mm. glad, that, glad the Six Nations is starting again because the plan was that we were going to go and watch Italy against England before obviously the <laughs> COVID stuff hit. Um, we, were looking, we were looking forward to going back. The last one we got to see at the Stadio Olimpico in Rome was Italy versus France. Um, yeah, yeah. And even though you're a Frenchman, Richard, we had to sort of support our adopted country for that particular day. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you should. Yeah. You should always. Yeah, I, I'm torn every time. If I go to Twickenham, I'm, I'm torn between France and England. You yeah. Know? yeah. I'm Because I'm, uh, I, I know a lot of the, the, the English player. And, you know, I, I'm so torn because I'm so close to, to my home, uh, home in here. So it's like, so the last time I went to Twickenham, I had a... And my French top had an English top with the roses in it and the bath hat. So I cover all my anger all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Just cover all bases. That's, that, that's rugby. You can do that in rugby. You can't do that in football. You know, yeah. it's, uh, you know, oh, yeah. I always said, you, if you're in deep trouble and you work in a pub and you need somebody to help you, if it's somebody with a rugby shirt, that guy will help you. If you somebody with a, if you got somebody with a, a football shirt, you just think, oh, bloody hell. You know? <laughs> it's very different on Yeah. So it's, uh, but it's, it's, it's a sort of, um, we remember when we sort of went to that Italy and France match, we're all sort of going along in our various sort of Italian sort of tops. And we had an Afro one with, with the Italian flag, so red, white, and green. Um, and it wasn't until we got into the, into the ground that we realized that our seats were in the middle of all the French fans. So, <laughs> so it's like everybody's like, you know, all good natured, everybody. So, you know, a few of them yeah, yeah, yeah. beforehand. That's the way it should be. Yeah. yeah. So it was, it was all good natured. But then, obviously, French national anthem first before the kickoff. And then the Italian national anthem started. So we stood up. And then it was only then that we realized there was about 500 mobile phone cameras trained on us. And then we looked up to see our faces on the big screen in the Stadio Olimpico as well. <laughs> So it's like, oh, right, okay. So we, we so I had to pretend like we're singing hymns in the school assembly, sort of mouthing the words silently and not having a clue what we were singing. But, but yeah, can't, yeah, yeah, can't wait for the international rugby to start ticking off the days as we're doing it. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. And uh, I think it's, uh, rugby's got so many good things about it. You know, it's, uh, it's better than football anyway, so that's fine. <laughs> completely agree. And my wife would... would agree with you 100 percent. but okay so just some sort of quick random questions just to just to finish it off um okay so what three ingredients or foods do you always have to have in your house oh god butter yeah pasta okay <laughs> and bread, of course. Oh, obviously. Take, take this bread. You forget bread and butter. Yeah. I sure. always run out of bloody bread. I've never got bread in my house. I make bread all the time. I never <laughs> bread in my house. Yeah, your wife goes, did so, you get any bread, Richard? Oh, bloody hell, I forgot yeah. that. But that's the ingredient. Of course, plenty of wine as well, so I'm safe. Oh, okay, exactly. Bread, wine, and pasta, that's a meal in itself. But, yeah. um, okay. Um, <laughs> I've never been one of one of these people who sort of has a has a drawer full of of kitchen gadgets. Yeah. Um, because I believe so like they're just just a waste of cash and use them once and just never use them again. Do you have I agree. A, yeah, do you have a particularly favorite kitchen toy that you you use or you couldn't be without? You know, I'm thinking of um, yeah, like, uh, like the bench scraper for starters. Yeah, I've got my scraper. I've got one. I must have one in my pocket somewhere. There was one somewhere in here earlier. There's always a scraper around. There was one there, I think. But yeah, scraper, a plastic scraper. I always got one. Uh, I use it at home. But um, I think my favorite one at home when I'm cooking with is, uh, yeah, knife. You got knife. You know, it's fine. I got a, a 1950s um, a fish slice, which is a, you can't find them anymore. And mm. they are nice and wide and with a you know, it's like a like a fork, and it's the most practical thing if I do steak, fish, or whatever, all the time. So, you know, it's um, nothing fancy, like you said. You know, if I got one knife, I'm happy, and uh, my fish slice, my scraper for my dough, I'm very happy. <laughs> okay, just just one final question then. Okay, 
Um, imagine you've got a dinner party, okay? You've yeah. got four people. You can invite four people to that dinner party. Um, can be anybody alive or dead. So who, yeah. would you, who would you have at your ideal dinner party? My wife and three kids, definitely. Because every dinner uh, we sit down together, it's precious. You know, because the kids growing, they leave home and... And you realize when they leave that the time you had together was so precious. And cooking for them is the greatest pleasure you can get. You know, so my son's coming up from uni on Thursday. I can't wait to cook and to have everybody sit around the table. Yeah, it'd be nice to have, you know, I've got plenty of friends, chefs or whatever, and it's great fun. But, you know, the, when, you, when you look back in time is those days you spend with your family, your, your close one, and chatting about things, life or whatever. The, those times, those kids will remember that as well. So, you know, yeah, it's nice to have famous people around, you know, and I've cooked for some, uh, eight, eight with plenty of them. You know, I went for Chinese with Ken Home. We went for Chinese in town with Ken Home. That's amazing. But, you know, that's, that's anecdotal. That's quite good fun. But if you look deep down inside you, who would you like around you? I think it's your family now. And my three kids and my wife and when we sit together, we have a bottle of wine and we chat and everything else. It's, it's wonderful because I want them to experience the same with their kids one day. If you don't put that into them, they won't do it. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it's important for, for the family and, and for, for their future to be able to understand and appreciate to spend that time eating together when somebody spends time cooking for them to understand it. And, you know, from... The kitchen is your engine of the house. It's same in Italy, same in France. And back in the old days, you spend a lot of time in the kitchen. More time in the kitchen than you spend anywhere else. And then that's where you solve your problem. So if your daughter had something to say to you, whatever, you do it in the kitchen. You chat when you do something. My son, if they want to talk to me, I'm always in the kitchen. So they come and chat to me there. So the kitchen's got, it's, it's got the memory of all your life all the time. The, the good, the bad. And your party, when you throw a party at home, everybody ends up in the kitchen. If I cook at home, my friends come in the kitchen, we cook together. So I think, you know, you can have the most glamorous person in the world that you admire, you know, and would you have good memory out of it? It'd be nice. But I think your roots and your family at heart is the one who matters. And so I think, yeah, I was thinking about the question you sent me. I thought, actually, I quite enjoy going home tonight, cook for them, you know, and sit together. And when my son's coming up from uni, he'd be there. And if it's one night when he's not going out with his mates, then that day we all eat together, we'll appreciate it. Yeah. Because that's what we used to do from early age. So it's, um, it's a funny question, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a simple question, yeah, uh, if that yeah. makes sense. No, 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 I agree. I think it's, you know, it's, that's, that's a fabulous way of putting it, really. Sort of it goes full circle to what we were talking about at the start. So, you know, sort of taking the time out to sort of cook good food for your family, to sit down, just to take the time to relax and just sort of chew the fat for the yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Well, thank you very much for talking to me, Richard, today. That's brilliant. Thank uh, you. My pleasure. Nice to see you. Excellent. Cool.